Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today, we're going to be looking at Fantasy Illustrated, an anthology published in 1982 from New Media Publishing. They were a comic book distributor, and just like uh, Capital Comics and Pacific, they decided to start making their own comics. Um, NMP weren't nearly as successful. They only had a handful of publications come out. This was one of them. And uh, what a way to start off. Beautiful P. Craig Russell cover. Um, I think we just saw this image in the past month or so on the channel. Uh, we looked at some other anthology. Maybe it was Voyages. And it had this image in black and white. But it's really nice to see it in color. Some really beautiful stuff. Man, P. Craig Russell can do no wrong in my book. Start off with an editorial by Richard Howell. He was a big fan guy. Uh, he was in fanzines and uh, did all aspects of the comic book uh, business. I think these are just public domain drawings here, or drawing. Pretty nice, though. So. We have the contents page. And we have the continuation of the editorial with another Seemingly a uh, public domain, old-timey image. Pretty cool, too. So we start off with the gin. And uh, this is, a. Uh, I like the, the credit box. It says, introducing the all-Steve squad. Englehart, author, Ditko, pencil artist, Lea Loha, ink artist, and the honorary Orzachowski. Of course, Tom Orzachowski. Um, this is some of the nicest Ditko artwork post, like, I don't know, mid 70s this is so nice and it's not just because because of Lea Aloha's inks i'm obviously steve Lea Aloha adds a lot of pol polish to this art but in the editorial richard howell even mentions how when he got the pencils from ditko the amount of detail was incredible and he it almost seems like uh ditko really poured his heart and soul into this one i don't know why but uh he really Put a lot of work into this one. And in the early 80s, there's a lot of stuff he did that there wasn't a lot of work put into. Some of his Micronauts annuals and some of the stuff he did for Marvel. Pretty slapdash stuff. This is excellent. This is like some of my favorite Steve Ditko artwork since the 60s. I mean, a big Shade the Changing Man fan, but this looks nicer. So uh, we see this boat pull into Cairo. And it's a section of Cairo that's very seedy and lawless. It uh, does not look safe. Um... But man, look at all these great characters, all the detail. So the captain of the boat is this guy named Coyne, C-O-Y-N-E. And this guy, Ali Pasha, has commissioned him to take him to Cairo. Coyne does not like Ali Pasha. He uh, seems pretty arrogant to him. And uh, Ali Pasha seems to have some kind of amazing abilities when he leaps off the boat. It's like, Coyne is like, I've never seen anyone leap like that before. Like, what are you, an acrobat or something? And uh, Ali Pasha bids him adieu. Look at these great faces here with the Lea Aloha inks. It's really nice. So uh, Coin is so pissed off. He's like, I need a drink. I'm going to go to a bar. Once again, amazing amount of detail for Ditko. All the background characters. So he's in the bar for like about a minute before he starts a fight and uh, turns into a big brawl. Some nice to go action panels. And he runs out of there, hightails it out of there because he's outnumbered. And he realizes he's got to lose these guys. He can't just run back to a ship or they might, you know, destroy it. So he's like going through all these back alleys and climbing on these rooftops. Look at the backgrounds in these two panels. That is some beautiful shit. Really nice stuff. So he finally loses them. And then he looks down from the rooftops. He sees Ali Pasha unconscious being carried off by these goons. They hit this like secret panel in the wall and this door opens. And when he looks inside, it looks really fancy in there. He's like... This is way too grand to be in this side of town. So as soon as they get inside, he jumps down. 
and he figures out how to open the wall. He saw what they did to the panel. And it's really nice in there. It's like something uh, like a sultan's, you know, castle inside. It's beautiful. And he's walking through this room and all of a sudden the whole floor tilts until it completely tips over, as we can see here. So this whole room is on a pivot. Once you like cross the halfway point, the whole thing tips over. As he descends into blackness um, and unconsciousness, he kind of has these flashback memories of how he got to the Middle East. He was an American bank robber, was caught, sent to jail, he escaped, and then I guess left the country so he wouldn't be put back in jail. So he wakes up and he's tied to this post. And when he opens his eyes, he sees this scene. He sees Ali Pasha tied to another post and we meet the Jinn. And the Jinn, through his dialogue, we realize obviously he has a very convoluted past with Ali Pasha. I think that it basically sounds like they've been enemies for years. We also see this beautiful woman. And uh, I don't know if this is Leia Aloha or just Ditko, you know, broken clocks right twice a day. But man, Ditko is like notorious for drawing the most unattractive women in comics. But look at her. She's uh, pretty, pretty usable. Pretty, uh, pretty luscious looking. So, uh, Jin and Ali Pasha are, you know, having their little tete-a-tete. -tete. Um, Ali Pasha is basically just saying, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and even though you're not my enemy, I, uh, I feel like we're in this, we've been in this, on the same side of the fence many times, but you, I am going to kill you. And of course, Coin is all like, shut your mouth. What the fuck are you doing? Look at this, like, you can see the Lealoha there. That's a whole lot of Lealoha on top of that. Oh, this one too. <laughs> it's just very, I would never even guess that was a Ditko panel if you showed that to me. But most of them, they are. It's not like he's totally overpowering him. Just adding a really nice polish. So at some point, I guess that Jen isn't noticing, he's distracted. The beautiful woman gets up and approaches Coin. He's like, you gotta get me out of here. And she's like, no, the Jen would kill me. <laughs> That's stupid. But I, I take, you've touched my heart. Take this pill, it's poison. Because what he has planned for you is a fate worse than death. And you're gonna wanna <laughs> just kill yourself. Look at the faces here. That's some really good stuff. So then she kisses him and walks off crying. I guess the djinn didn't see any of that, or I don't know how that happened. So uh, Coin and Ali Pasha are like standing on these uh, stones and they descend into this uh, crazy pit where there's all this like these cogs and machinery that are basically just gonna grind them up into mulch. That's how they're gonna have to die, slowly being crunched up. Holly Pasha says, I know how to get out of here, but you're, you're on the pedestal that I, I would need to uh, be able to do it. There's one main cog, and I if I disable it, it'll shut down the whole thing. So they, uh, basically says, we can work together. So Coin leaps over and grabs this pole and basically says, look, I'm a human trapeze now. Use me to leap over there. So Ali Pasha does, almost breaking his back in the process. And he lands and he breaks that main cog and the whole thing crunks down to a halt. So it looks like these guys like each other a little bit more now. And when Coin uh, asks Ali Pasha about who's that woman up there? Is that the Jin's harem girl? And he says, no, Mr. Coin, she is my wife. Dun, 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 to be continued. And so at least uh, for years, we wouldn't find out what happened. But I do believe these were reprinted in Coyote number no. seven from Epic Comics, because the Jin was a backup series in Coyote, um, written by Steve Engelhart. 
And so I got to find those because I think they might have continued the story. Because uh, without those, this is just a cliffhanger that is never resolved. This is how the, the comic ends. And there was only one issue of Fantasy Illustrated. But man, I want to get more of this. I love this Ditko art. Really nice stuff. So our next story is that uh, we see a prologue. And uh, it's this character, Alexander Risk. But uh, first we see this guy, Christopher Ravenhill. And he's out on his like family's palatial Long Island estate. I should mention, sorry, the creatives first. This is written by Don McGregor and uh, really nice art by Tom Sutton. Once again, this was never finished. There's like three, three chapters and a prologue in here. And this was never reprinted, unfortunately. So this is all you get. This guy's thinking about uh, his problems. He fell in, kind of fell in love with the maid and or at, at least fell in lust with her. And she got pregnant and he wants her to have an abortion. She doesn't want to. The family name will be besmirched, whatever. He's thinking about what he, what, what can he do? And then all of a sudden he hears these scary like animal noises and this giant wolf, this hellhound, leaps at him. I love this two-page spread, by the way, by Tom Sutton. Just really interesting layouts and the way he does the panels. I love this too, the, the roots and the branches. And the hellhound just totally kills him. And then the last panel, though, he's like in his crotch. He's basically castrating him. This is called The Hounds of Hell Theory, the name of the story. And uh, this is a creation of Don McGregor's. Once again, he loves Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock Holmes wasn't in the public domain, so he couldn't just do a Sherlock Holmes story. Like we already saw in that Amazing Adventures with Kill Raven, that he had that one character. That was a doppelganger of Sherlock Holmes, who I think appeared in a Marvel Black and White magazine. So now he's just doing it again. But this guy's different. He's a New Yorker, and it's the 1940s. It's uh, during World War II. We start off with Alexander Risk walking on the Brooklyn Bridge, middle of the night. He's collecting his thoughts, taking a little midnight stroll. Look at this interesting inking here. He comes across the sleeping uh, hobo and these rats are crawling all over him. So he kicks the rats off. He's kind of furious that they're just treating the guy this way, you know, walking all over him. But this guy wakes up and says, like, what the hell are you doing? Get the fuck away from me. And he threatens Risk with a broken bottle and then attacks him. Risk just looks like he knows judo. He just flips him over his shoulder effortlessly. And as he walks away, the guy's ranting at him. Just like, you ever come back here, I'll tear your heart out. I like those faces of the hobo there. So he, uh, the son comes up and he arrives at his, uh, his offices right next to this old timey theater. And we meet his, his Watson, if you will, Penelope. So she's the co-star of this series. He even mentions to her, like, you're a better Watson than I could ever hope for. He's not shy about his uh, affectation, his Sherlock Holmes affectation. He's not blind to it. So now we got chapter two. Hop Harrigan never had a name like that. So I guess Alexander Risk is hired by the Ravenhill family. Uh, they want to find out what happened to their son. So he goes to this little airport and takes a little plane out to Long Island. It's not that long a drive. I don't know why he didn't just drive out there, but whatever. And uh, they meet this pilot. His name is, uh, what's his name? He's got this kind of goofy name, Skip Cameron. And uh, he's very cocky, very full of himself guy. And on the flight out there, kind of angers Alexander Risk. 
He's like, good point, Sherlock. And he's like, I'm not Sherlock Holmes. He's very angry. And the pilot says, well, you'd better return his cap and cloak then. And he basically says, I'm fully aware that I look like Sherlock Holmes and I love his the works of Arthur Conan Doyle, but I am not him. I'm not worthy of those two, so. And then as he's flying, he has a flashback. Apparently he was in the war, or at least at, at some aerial battle, naval slash aerial battle in the Pacific. But just a quick little flashback. We don't know exactly his past yet. Chapter three, an ax to grind. So they're about to land in Long Island and there's some guy on the ground with a shotgun and he fires away at the plane. And the plane has to make an emergency landing. Which they do. And everyone's safe. And, uh, and then um, Risk uh, just starts running off, trying to find that guy who shot him. We see another flashback. Apparently in college, he was just a great athlete at everything. At, uh, at running... And wrestling. So uh, he totally loses Penelope and the pilot because he's he's fast. So he runs out to this cliff and he sees the ejected shotgun shells. And all of a sudden, this guy with an axe is hanging out there. There's a whole lot of Le Aloha in there too. And yeah, he's about to hit uh, Risk. Man, speaking of Filipino inking, look at that. Tom Sutton always tried a lot of different styles. He was, he was never content just doing the same thing. He'd always throw in like interesting little inking stuff and uh, panel arrangements. So uh, the ax, uh, the guy with the ax mi misses Risk, but Risk falls off the cliff. He grabs a root though. And this is how we end the story for all time. <laughs> He's about to chop Alexander Risk with the axe. And uh, even if he doesn't, it looks like Alexander Risk can't hold on for long. So unfortunately, this was never reprinted and, and completed. So this is all we'll ever get. This uh, It could have been some you know great Don McGregor gem in his oeuvre, but we'll never know. Kind of an interesting character. Um, I mean, he's just ripping off Sherlock Holmes' character, but it's a great Sherlock Holmes is a great character. By the way, here's the ad for their uh, companion magazine, Adventure Illustrated. I'm pretty sure, as far as comic books go, this is all um, NMP ever did, as far as comic books. I had this comic, and I don't know why, because it's got Doug Munch, Bill Sankovich, Pat Boyette, Steve Ditko, Jim Starlin cover, more Tom Sutton stuff. It says Paul Galassi, but I don't remember Paul Galassi being in it. And, but I don't know. I just read it, reread it re like a year ago. And I was like, I don't really ever want to read this again. I don't like it. And all the stories were continuing. So it wasn't even a full story. And uh, so I, I, I sold it. To be honest, this Fantasy Illustrated, I was uh, really contemplating if this should be kicked out of the Academy. But speaking of which, this is one of the main reasons I didn't. Just because it has this fantasy classic about King Arthur, Hunting of the Heart. And it's illustrated by P. Craig Russell. And I've never seen these reprinted. A lot of P. Craig Russell's art, you know, from portfolios and covers has got, been recycled over the years in various anthologies. Never saw this before. And really classic, great P. Craig Russell art. So I'm not really going to get into the story since it's not comics. And, uh, but, you know, it's a typical King Arthur story, you know. Fighting Morgan Le Fay. And there she is. Beautiful drawing by P. Craig Russell. Love this logo. I love just that look on her face. Yeah, I wish I had more illustrations of the story. But, uh, yeah, getting these, these two P. Craig Russell illustrations that I've never seen reprinted anywhere else is pretty nice. So here we have a uh, Raider chapter two. And the reason why is because chapter one was in the previous mentioned adventure illustrated. We just saw the ad for this is another reason why I probably didn't keep that comic because it's not 
that great. Um, the script is by Mark Evanier. He's the creator of this, the uh, concept, too. And it's pretty okay. It's whatever. But, yeah, this art by Mike Sikowski um, is, is not pleasing to me. I do not like it. Um, Mike Sikowski, longtime DC artist. That guy probably did like 100 issues of the Justice League in a row. He, uh, all through the 60s and 70s, he did tons of stuff for DC. So this is way past his prime, and uh, this, is some cr this is some crappy art. I know some old-timers are going to give me shit, but yeah, I call them as I see them. The, uh, this first page is a recap of that first chapter. The premise is kind of interesting. There's this, uh, basically Earth and uh, their colonies in the solar system. They've been taken over by a theocracy. Church became state and state became church. And the prime one, sorry, the prime one became master of both. And this is the prime one with this bozo haircut. Kind of looks ridiculous. So he's this total like high pope. Um you know, absolute ruler. Our hero Raider and this, uh, his fellow scientist, her name is, uh, shit. Oh yeah. Loyita. They're, they were totally in love. They were just working on science with this guy, Dr. W, this genius doctor. And they were just kind of ignoring this, uh, horrible government, but, uh, the horrible government wasn't ignoring them. And they, uh, didn't like that they were messing around with God's laws of nature. And they sent some soldiers, the tribunal soldiers, and they killed Loyita. And Raider escaped, as well as Dr. W. But they're now separated. So now we see uh, the Prime One. And this guy here, Crusader One, he's basically like a, a hitman for the, the church government. And look at him. This is so ridiculous. He looks like a clown. <laughs> Not very intimidating. I mean, he's supposed to be like, you know, the revolutionary guard in Iran, but he looks like an idiot. So, but he's a total fanatical believer. He's like, I'm going to get this Raider guy for the good of the church, for God's glory. Meanwhile, we see Raider heading to this little planetoid that's a university. It's where he, he's an alumni of. And he's hoping that Dr. W might be there. He's already been looking around the solar system trying to find Dr. W. Because when Dr. W escaped, he had all the DNA strands of a lot of people, but most importantly, of Loyita, because he was a cloning specialist. So he's trying to find Dr. W, find that DNA strand, and hoping to bring Loyita back to life, because he loves her so much. We see a flashback of his college days. Looks like he's at this frat party. And uh, his best friend friend here is a total party animal. He's like uh, Bluto Blutarski. And uh, apparently he was really shy back then. So he could never make a move on Loita. He would just admire her from afar. So he gets to the um, college. And the dean is his old buddy, his old drinking buddy. But he's not his old buddy anymore. He's totally become a church guy. And is brainwashed. Raider tells him his plan and he's kind of horrified. He's like, you can't go against the laws of, you know, God and nature. And he, you know, life and death is not for humans to meddle with. So he's like, ah, fuck you. You're, you're not my buddy anymore. He goes to the library to get some information. The doors are locked. He breaks in. All the books are gone. They vaporized them. Because, you know, the tribunal doesn't want anyone reading and thinking. And then Crusader, I almost called him Clown One. Crusader One uh, this has been stalking him for a little while. And he comes in and is about to shoot him. And then all of a sudden, these guys come out of nowhere wearing masks. And they incapacitate Crusader One. And they're like, come with us, Raider. We're rebels. They take off their masks when they get to a safe place. They've got a little, like, hideout in this uh, college. It's on the fourth and a half floor, so nobody can find it, supposedly. And uh, they've been monitoring the government's transmissions. They broke, cracked the code, you know? So uh, they can hear all the plans of the government. So they found out that the government was about to capture Raider 
at the college, they intercepted before Crusader One could get him, or right around when he did, and they rescued him. One of the members of this rebel group, Jill, just takes an instant liking to him. Apparently, they're like free love kind of hippie people. And uh, the leader, well, maybe he's not the leader. One of the, the guys, the resistance guy says, you know, we figure the government hates you so much. We're, we're probably allies, right? Because you're like number one on their shit list. So now we see the dean of the college, his old buddy, and he's kind of confessing to the prime one, telling him the whole plan of Raider. And the prime one, looking even more clown-like here, he's furious. You know, he's like, this is sacrilege. He's gonna up, upset the, all the universal laws of science and or God's will, you know? Playing with life and death. So that night, Jill, She's just instantly in love with Raider. And Raider doesn't want to sleep with her. He says, you're lovely, you're wonderful, but I, I'm i still in love with Lloyd. And she kind of gets it, but she's bummed. She's like, because she really digs him right off the bat. So she convinces him to at least let her tag along on his mission. So they get in a spaceship and they fly to Uranus which is now called Quadrax because the tribunal, the, the theocracy, changed the name of Uranus because, because of all the lewd jokes about it. <laughs> it was the butt of too many dirty jokes. So they didn't want anyone uh, even thinking about Uranus. So they changed the name. When they get there, there's this uh, indigenous p uh, alien race there. But unfortunately, the missionaries are, there's a handful of Earth missionaries from the theocracy there already kind of imposing their will. They heard a rumor that there's some doctor who's been taking care of the natives. And his name is like Francis Bacon. So they're like, that's a pseudonym. This could be Dr. W. Let's see if we can find him. They stumble upon a, they see a funeral for uh, one of the natives. And... This uh, tribunal priest is doing the burial ceremony. And the mother of the alien, his, I think his name is Dama. He, Dama's mother is uh, speaks up and says, this is not how I want my son to be, uh, to be buried, you know? These words you speak have no meaning to his life because he's just doing like typical funerary type speech, you know? And the priest basically says, Oh, your barbaric ways are a thing of the past. We're here to civilize you. And uh, you'll learn our civilized ways soon. So they bury him. And Raider and Jill figure, okay, that woman doesn't like these uh, tribunal guys. So she, she'll probably talk to us. They follow her to her house. Man, some of this art. Hey. And... Uh, She basically tells them that Dama kind of died mysteriously. He had no marks or injuries on him. The doctor had no explanation. Meanwhile, we see the shadowy figure go to the to Dama's grave. And he unearths it and opens the casket. And he presses this button or something. And Dama's alive. He comes to life. But it's almost like he's a zombie. And uh, he tells them, go inside and wait for me to my craft, you will respond only to my voice. And Dama just walks off wordlessly. You know, he's like a zombie. He's got no will of his own. It turns out that Dr. W is in the bushes seeing this whole thing. And uh, the mysterious figure, I guess he saw him and cuts around behind him and knocks him out with this, uh, this gas. Meanwhile, once again, <laughs> There, Jill and Raider are lounging around naked, not having sex. And they hear a hubbub outside. They find Dr. W, and Dr. W's dying. It's too late. Look at this crazy way he draws her hair here. It reminds me of those coloring posters from the 70s. Me and my brother used to get. They were kind of groovy. And uh, 
They would just add all these groovy psychedelic lines so you could have more fun coloring them. But just, it's kind of neat. But just so it really stands out as different. He wasn't drawing her hair like that in the first half of the story. So they uh, check out Dr. W's funeral. And once again, it's a tribunal funeral. And Crusader One shows up. They should have killed him when they had the chance. And I guess he has to reload his gun. And somehow he's so distracted by reloading his gun, Raider escapes. He loses him. And Raider runs to the, the tribunal building, pretends he's a tribunal soldier, and says, ah, a guy just took my uniform. He's an enemy. Go get him. So trying to make them kill Crusader One. And uh, Crusader One comes in the tent, the jig's up, and he shoots at Raider, who leaps out of the way. And the laser blast just brings the whole building down on top of everybody. Two of the Tribunal soldiers come out unscathed. And they see this body that looks like it's wearing Raider's clothes, but the face is hidden. So they just, they, they basically kill him. But it's actually Crusader One. He's like, no, wait, it's me. But they don't listen or they don't hear him in time. And they basically uh, zap him to death. So they think Raider's dead. They think they got Raider. I don't know how Raider exchanged clothes with Crusader One in the middle of a building falling around him in like 10 seconds. But whatever. So uh, Raider and Jill are at uh, Dr. W's offices going through his file cabinets trying to find that DNA strand. But what he does find is this micro tape module. Look at that hair right there, by the way. More of that. And uh, it's Dr. W. They find a little tape uh, player. And Dr. W says that he was onto some conspiracy that he realize that the people who died on this planet, they're not necessarily dead. And that's why he was watching the grave that night because he was trying to prove his theory. And so Raider picks up a shovel, runs to Dr. W's grave and digs it up and there's no body in the grave. So as he looks up at the stars, He's uh, thinking, where could he be? Where's Dr. W? And it says, next, the creationists. But we'll never find out what happened with the creationists because I don't think any of these were ever published again. We only get these two big chapters. Kind of funny that they are, like, obviously taking a jab. Well, Mark Evanier is taking a jab at the moral majority who are getting big at the time. And uh, the story is called The Creationists. So that's it for Fantasy Illustrated 1982 Anthology. And um, yeah, I was, uh, this almost got kicked out. <laughs> but I'm going to save it just in, at least until I get those uh, Coyote reprints of Ditko's art from the gin. Then again, I do like having it in black and white. It looks really nice. The, the interplay between black and white and these pages, beautiful. Just great inking, uh, great design, good stuff. And also the P. Craig Russell illustration. So I don't know. Maybe in 10 years I'll reevaluate it and realize I have no room and uh, I'll, I'll get rid of it. But for now, it's staying in the Academy. Hope you guys enjoyed uh, looking at this and uh, hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies.